This is a neat tracking shot. Early in the film, this is one of the first times they actually used a tracking shot, which is where they put the camera, usually like on rails, and they'll slide it along to give you the illusion that you're like moving or floating. Well, for this shot, they had a couple of problems. The camera was going to travel up the street here, but the camera, which weighed 200 pounds, had to be put inside of a soundproof bubble that was made out of plywood, fiberglass, and lead. By then, it weighed 850 pounds, so the actual dolly to move the camera was a tow truck. I've seen pictures of this huge tow truck with the clamp on the back like it was going to tow a car, but it's the Cinerama camera backing up this street with hundreds of actors on it that had to be coordinated. And here's one of the interesting parts that you get from, not from the TV experience, but only from a Cinerama screen. Look at the signs on the buildings on both sides of the street. You're able to see every sign in focus. That was a problem when they were making the film. If they had went to the sign department and said, make me up some signs that they would look like in the 1840s, they thought, wait a minute, in the 1840s, there were no computers, there were no presses of, of, to make large signs like that. They were all hand-painted. Well, each and every sign throughout the film is hand-painted, and it looks it, because you can see that sharp, close detail. Here's a fun shot with the camera sitting on the front of the flying arrow. When you see this in the film, You'll see Debbie Reynolds actually on the far left side of the screen, and the character, I believe, who plays her brother, he's over here somewhere on the far right side of the screen. If you've ever seen this in videotape or television, you'll never see both those characters at the same time. Hollywood either does one of two processes, a, what they call pan and scan, where the camera, the TV camera, photographing what the movie looks like, will move from left to right to show you one side or the other, and it really looks noticeable once you, you find out what it is. It's kind of like an electric, kind of motorized, hum, then back again, hum, <laughs> and it just looks phony as hell. I mean, pardon my French, I couldn't say that on Sunday. Phony as heck. The other process they could use, and they use this a lot of times with the early CinemaScope movies, like How to Marry a Millionaire. They would show just the left side of the screen, and then the camera would blank and just show you the right side of the screen. One of the unusual problems, though, that television can't compensate for were when they would use a computer to tell which side of the screen to show. And, and How to Marry a Millionaire, the camera's looking for just movement on screen to follow. And there's two people sitting at a table talking. I think it's Lauren McCall and William Powell. And literally, on a television screen, you see the noses of each of the actors <laughs> talking to each other, because that's all the computer can pick up. But they put it out that way on videotape. They, they told the public, here's this wonderful movie, but they wouldn't let them see it all. Here's some interesting shots. Again, this is out of, uh, I believe, one of the program books on how the West was won, showing you the full size of the frame, how wide it is, 2.8 times as wide as it is tall. On television, they would cut it out so you would think Gregory Peck was playing poker in this small ship, but you had no idea that the bar and other customers were on either side. Constantly, while they were making the film, they always wanted to put activity, natural things going on, as if we were there on either side of the screen. But it was a lot of trouble. There's actually over 12,000 extras in this film, people they hired to add for background. We filmed it in seven different states. This is a shot that was made in California when Debbie Reynolds going to find out about the gold mine she inherits. And again, you can see, if they were going to show it on television, when this character is talking to Gregory Peck, or this character is playing, talking to Debbie Reynolds, they can only show one character at a time if the picture is three times as wide as it is tall. So you're going to get to see the movie. If you haven't seen it before in Cinerama, the whole picture, just like the director, the cast, the writer intended, and it's even better shape than the one we played yesterday. Here's kind of a neat shot that was made in the Rockies at 11,000 feet. When you're watching the Cinerama movie, think about They've got to photograph this huge wide, huge, wide slice of life. Everything in front of the camera has got to be perfect. But what's going on behind the camera are the hundreds of people that man the cameras. Oh, get a load of this. This is sunlight. This gentleman's not even wearing a shirt. And still, they brought lights out onto the set because the brighter the picture, the brighter the, the uh, object that they were photographing, the clearer the photography, the sharper the image. One of the uh, sharpest films I've ever seen was Lawrence of Arabia, where 90% of the film was filmed in a desert in bright sun. It's incredible focus, but it still doesn't compare to some of these scenes in How the West Was Won, where you can see the detail of the leaves, the actors, the ripples in the water. And I hate to tell you, you're going to see more flies in this movie than you've ever seen in any movie before. Also, there's some interesting shots when they'll do a close-up of, of the men. You can 
Ms. Health who shaved that day, who didn't shave that day. And some of the ladies who were used to being made up for a regular camera when they were uh, in films, they do a perfect job of makeup, but sometimes when they turn their head, you can see where the makeup stops. There's a little, little shadow lines there that they accidentally put on. Here's another shot of John Ford, who at the time, is, um, he only made a couple more films after this. I think he did, uh, what was it, Cheyenne Autumn and uh, Man Who Shot Liberty Balance were done right after this. Before this film, he did what a lot of people consider his masterpiece, The Searchers. John Wayne so admired John Ford as a director and as a man, they were not only drinking buddies, gambling buddies, but when you saw John Wayne's kind of lilting walk, you know how John Wayne walks, he was copying John Ford, his hero, this Irish immigrant. John Ford, uh, at this time, you can't really see it because the bill of his hat had lost the use of one of his eyes. So even while he was making this film, he was using only one eye. This is kind of a fun shot I just put in because I thought you'd get a kick out of it. When they made How the West Was Won, they had so many problems with making the film accurate, making the film so people could see just the incredible clarity that the, what a Cinerama camera could deliver the sound. They actually hired true Indians. It's one of the one, a real rarity to see an American Western where they don't have white men painted red. They, they rounded up Indians from four different tribes from four different states. There are gentlemen, I think these two represent the, the ones I've read about, who are actually survivors of the Battle of Wounded Knee, the massacre that wiped out almost an entire tribe. They're a couple of the few living uh, Indians who were still alive at the time the film was made. When they rounded up the buffalo for the buffalo sequence, they went to four different states to round up, I think it was close to a couple thousand buffalo. That was about all that were existing at that time. I'm not sure if we have any more today. Well, this is kind of cute, but I had to just pause to tell you about this one Indian. This gentleman right here holding the staff, and I'm not kidding you, I can prove it to you, it's documented. His real name is William Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> not kidding, that is his real name. Here's an interesting shot. You can see the now more sophisticated Cinerama camera. They actually created an aluminum bubble to correct up it so it'd be lighter, easier to move. They had to build this temporary uh, train station out in the middle of the wilderness. Uh, someone who came to see the movie, I think it was like two weeks ago, Peter came from Germany. Uh, I guess Germ uh, Peter's got a little bit of disposable money. One of his hobbies in studying films is he packs up his wife and his belongings and they go to where a movie was filmed. He told us he actually went to the location where this was photographed at, and there's a plaque on a rock that explains that this is where the buffalo sequence for How the West Was Won was filmed. But he said it's all overgrown with trees now, all this area that they had. And I hate to say this, but this is how exact they had to be for making the film. They bulldozed a lot of this, this area out to get so far back into the wilderness that How the West Was Won would look authentic. It would look like the first time white men were coming into this wilderness. They literally, the Erie Canal boat they bought in 1840, Erie Canal boat, and had it shipped to the Ohio River to film it along Paducah, Kentucky. Um, they bought a train from the 1800s and built the track that you see the train wreck upon, and they wrecked the train. When they would go back into the wilderness, now think about this, they've got to go to where the highways end, then they've got to go to where the asphalt road ends, then they go to where the gravel road ends, and then they would unload off the back of their diesel trucks bulldozers to clear out the trees to get so far back and when they took back these hundreds of extras and these stars they had to take back food, trailers, camera equipment, dark rooms, film, tons and tons of equipment back deep in national forest where people hadn't been for years to get some of the shots you're going to see today in this film. And this is kind of a cute piece of, of history about the film, the famous water tower. They custom built the water tower to be knocked over by the buffalo in the film. And in the program book, you'll actually see a photograph of the stuntman on top of the water tower as it's falling over. Well, seeing how movies are sometimes, and special effects are hard to control, you'll see the water tower in an early shot. You'll see the water tower tilting in a shot, but you will never see it hit the ground because during dress rehearsal, somebody let loose of a rope and it fell over, but the cameras weren't running. Henry Fonda, I'm hoping he's, hoping he's using darts, picking off the wild buffalo. It's kind of interesting, too, a lot of the characters in the film uh, are named after actual historical characters. One of Henry Fonda's characters uh, actually existed. 
I did have about another 10 slides on how the West was won, but American cinematographer, the magazine, has borrowed them. And I explained to them I needed them for this weekend, and they said, well, we're still trying to figure out which we, ones we want to use in our December issue. So if you want to see the slides that you missed, in December, pick up an American cinematographer magazine, and hopefully there will be some of the slides from the film. How the West is won was the seventh and the final three projector Cinerama film. When MGM made How the West Was Won, they didn't intend for it to cost so much, but it actually became the third most expensive film in the studio's history. Now, for those of you who are film buffs, you know that MGM was the largest studio in Hollywood for decades. The most expensive film they ever made was Gone with the Wind. The second film was a little film called Ben Hur. How the West Was Won became the third most expensive film that they made. And let's say, if you were going, if I could use a graph, let's say it cost this much money. If you stacked up a, thousand, a few thousand dollars bills, it cost this much money. But when they released it, it was such an incredible film. They could play it in 90 cinemas, 90 um, three projector Cinerama cinemas in the United States, around the world, 240. That was the peak of how many Cinerama theaters there were around the world. It made this much money back. So there was this large chunk of profit that went back to MGM and Cinerama Incorporated. But they had so much trouble making the movie, they got really cold feet about running the risk of doing what they did with Wonderful World, The Brothers Grimm. Spent a lot of money on the process and the effects, but not necessarily have a film that lives up to all that anticipation and expense. The next film that they were planning to do was something called It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. This was to be the eighth film made in Cinerama. They intended to make it in the three projector process. But remember, when they're filming it, it takes three times the cameras, seven times the sound men, because each channel of sound had to have a separate man with a headset on listening to just what that microphone would hear from wherever that speaker would be behind the screen. He would be listening to make sure that the sound and the action would match. So you had all this incredible expense of filming it. And then when they would send it to a theater, they'd have to have three projectionists. Does this work? Yeah. Three projectionists, one man on each projector, a separate man just to balance the sound, and then a fourth man who was just called in, uh, like master control engineer, he'd actually sit down front with these guys so he could see all three panels of the screen and hear the sound just as the audience heard it. And on headsets, he would tell maybe the guy running the able projector, you need to raise your frame up a little bit, you need to do your focus. Or on Baker, turn your bulb up a little bit, it's not as bright as the others. Well, it was an incredibly expensive film to present to people. But when it opened in 1962, even in such a limited run, and with huge expenses behind it, it became the number one grossing film in 1962 in the United States of America. Still, Cinerama had, had so many people involved with the company over their 10-year history, they would come on board, make a little money, and jump ship. Or somebody else would come in and buy more stock and wrestle over control. Basically, it's kind of like each time they made a movie, they would get another producer who had won another 10% of the profit. It became such a top-heavy company that they needed to make so much money to pay for the films and to present the films that it became almost impossible. What they decided to do was to take the Cinerama logo and actually sell it for use. But Cinerama had nothing to do with the Mad Mad, Mad, Mad World. They took a 70 millimeter camera, just one camera, and filmed it in something called Ultra Panavision. And Ultra Panavision said there's no way you can use our process and keep, this is an original ad, keep our name off of it. So when they made films like It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, Grand Prix, The Greatest Story Ever Told, Ice Station Zebra, um, and 2001 A Space Odyssey, they were all filmed in Ultra Panavision, and you'll find that name in all the credits. And somewhere in the beginning of the film, you'll find the word Cinerama, because the public had discovered a beautiful, incredible way of seeing films on a 146 degree curved screen. They use three projectors to show only the image to get this incredible clarity, 25 times sharper focus. The sound was on a separate piece of film, completely not connected to any of the opticals, that showed that played back seven bands of sound. And each one of those bands of sound held a full range from 20 decibels, which is so low it, the buffalo actually caused the chairs to shake, or so high up to 20,000 cycles, higher than a human voice can hit. It takes a violin to hit a note that high. It's like high C above high C. Uh, in fact, I had a couple of people complain the first weekend we played How the West Was Won. 
they speak because you have you will you will hear frequencies you will not hear at home off your stereo off your TV set off a phonograph if you want to hear some of these frequencies you've either got to go out and hear it from mother nature like the buffalo themselves or hear it from a symphony and you know how different it sounds when you hear a live symphonic concert how raw and real and bright and brilliant the sound is and then you go home and play your CD of it and it's real good but I could swear it kind of reminds me of that tin can with a wire on the back something's missing Something's getting processed out. Well, Cinerama never allowed their sound to be processed. So you, in the real quiet parts, you will hear a little bit of a hiss or a hum. That's because nothing was being held back. Nothing was being denied. And when people complained about the film being kind of loud, I had to break it to them gentle. Buffalo are loud. <laughs> it's a mad, 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 mad world. It's a wonderful film. We don't want to knock the film. We just want to tell the public the truth. And that is that the use of the name Cinerama was a lie. It was not the Cinerama process that they come to know and love. When these other films were made and Cinerama's name was on the front, it was kind of like telling you, this is the Cadillac of cars, but it's not a Cadillac. Or it's the Rolls Royce of cars, but it's not a Rolls Royce. Well, eventually Cinerama got into a lot of financial trouble because they weren't really making the three camera, three projector films anymore. They had sold the use of their name, their trademark the thing that people had, had grown to love. So when a Cinerama logo popped up on screen, it didn't mean as much as it used to. So why would any company pay when they were gonna make a film for the use of the name? The company ended up going belly up. All these 240 theaters around the world that had the equipment suddenly didn't need Abel and Charlie. There were projection booths, the equipment was didn't, couldn't be used. It was, the shape of the film is completely different. It's six perforations tall, it's actually um, a third taller than it is wide, opposite of what a television screen is. And these pieces of equipment just ended up collecting dust. Every once in a while, maybe they would need the lighthouse off the back, they'd take the ball ball, or they'd need the base, they'd disconnect that. Or maybe they needed pieces of it, not really the gears that would drive the Cinerama film, and they would strip the cameras, and eventually there would be not enough of them left to run Cinerama, I mean, if they wanted to. And this was happening around the world. They would call up the company in the Cinerama in California and say, can we ship you back the reels? They're so big and bulky and heavy, they're kind of in the way. And Cinerama said, we're not going to pay the shipping to return it because we've got hundreds of reels here we can't use. No one's calling for the films. It costs too much to show them. We've got to like have four times the staff to run these films. So the films ended up getting stuck in the back rooms. They ended up getting stuck in basements. John's told me so many heartbreaking stories about films that were stored in basements. Basements flood. Films don't like floods. Films would get ruined, so they'd throw them out. He told me a story when he went out to California years ago doing his research that Cinerama, some of the employees, had to tell him the truth that the warehouse where a lot of the original films and equipment were stored was so expensive just to rent the building that they ended up selling it to a Korean church. And the church wanted the, their basement emptied with all the films in it. They would load them up in a truck and take them to a junkyard. And they took John to this junkyard. And he said, there's 20 foot high piles of these Cinerama films, reels, original prints of This is Cinerama, Seven Wonders of the World, South Search for Paradise, South Sea's Adventure, Cinerama Holiday, Wonderful World of Brothers Groom, How the West Was Won, In the Rain, In the Sun, Rotting, Falling Apart. I'm getting followed.